Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. First, Ryan Scott. Ryan is the director of the Social Justice Institutes at Carlo University. The Social Justice Institutes exemplify Carlo University's strong commitment to social justice, ethical forward thinking and responsible leadership and service to the community. Mr. Scott received his bachelor's degree in communications. He concentrated in business with a minor in history from West Virginia University. He augmented his skill set by earning a master's degree in education from Argosy University in Atlanta. He is currently pursuing his doctorate of education at the University of Pittsburgh. Our second speaker, his colleague, Jess Gold, currently serves as the program coordinator for Carlo University's Center for Youth Media Advocacy and Social Justice Institutes. Through her role at Carlo University, she coordinates a citywide <clears throat> youth voice working group in partnership with Remake Learning Network. Prior to her position at Carlo, she served as the program manager of Assemble, a community space for art and technology. Jess has nearly 10 years of experience in community-based education, and she looks forward to continuing to teach and learn with young people. Thank you both for being with us today on our Carlo Connections, and we will open up the conversation with Ryan. Great, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Kim, uh, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for joining us uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Mellon, uh, and Provost Ghosh. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you all for being a part of this dynamic conversation. Uh, Jess and I are really excited about the conversations that have been taking place as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and we are excited to uh, share our findings with you today. Uh, we had two panels uh, that we worked with through the course of this conversation, and we're going to share some of the findings and information from our community leaders today. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the Social Justice Institutes, uh, guided by the mission, history, and traditions of Carlo University and its founders and sponsors. And the, the uh, Social Justice Institutes at Carlo aim to facilitate systemic change by informing practice and educating for social justice. The SJI supports the university's strategic plan by serving as an incubator for faculty research, providing opportunities and securing partnerships for community-based learning and serving as a conduit for community engagement. Uh, for those of you social media users, uh, I urge you to follow us uh, on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And the links are uh, listed here. Here you'll also find information uh, regarding social justice institutes and a lot of the uh, events that we have, as well as other pertinent information and resources uh, that pertain to social justice. So just to share a little bit of background on why we hosted a series of community conversations regarding uh, COVID-19 uh, and social justice or COVID-19 from a social justice lens. Uh, we, you know, as a social justice institutes, we're noticing that a lot of conversations about COVID-19 were presenting it as a public health crisis, which it undoubtedly is, um, but we're focusing less on the social impact. Uh, and we felt that it was really critical to better understand the social impact of COVID-19 and highlight the work and expertise of uh, organizations, individuals, and institutions uh, working to mitigate, uh, you know, negative social effects of, of the pandemic. And so we really kind of wanted to base our community conversations on a couple of, of, of critical ideas. Uh, one being that COVID-19 is both a social crisis and a public health crisis. Um, that the social impacts of COVID-19 uh, were, you know, causing causing in many ways just as much, if not more, more damage. Um, that COVID-19 has made existing systemic injustices more. Uh, visible and impactful. So the uh, systemic inequities that we're seeing highlighted by this pandemic predate the start of the pandemic. Um, but of course, what's happening now is, is deepening those things. And then finally, to work towards systemic change in this unique moment, we really need to better understand our local context. 
certainly many of the things that are happening locally uh, are also happening nationally. But we uh, at the Social Justice Institutes are in communication and partnership with uh, lots of folks doing work on the ground. Um, and we wanted to understand really how this is impacting um, some of uh, the most marginalized communities here in our city and in our region. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we hosted two uh, community COVID-19 and social justice in Pittsburgh panels. The first was on public policy and community, and that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit. Uh, we had wonderful uh, esteemed guests uh, on our panel. Uh, one included the senior leader of equity and inclusion of the, at the Department of Human Services, Jessica Ruffin. Uh, Amy White, who was the director of family and youth engagement at A-plus schools. Marita Garrett, who is the mayor of Wilkinsburg Borough, president and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Betty Cruz, and Carlos' own director of equity and inclusion, Dr. Malia Johnson, uh, were all panelists that all gave uh, tremendous insight on their positions uh, and how COVID-19 COVID has affected their positions and the uh, clients that they work with. So, uh, in thinking about COVID-19, it's uh, inequitably affected vulnerable and marginalized populations. The COVID-19 pandemic is not only a public health crisis, but also a mental health crisis and also a crisis uh, related to social injustices. Many of the vulnerable populations that were highlighted uh, in COVID-19 included uh, low-income family, families, uh, incarcerated and homeless persons, youth in foster care, uh, people over the age of 65, especially those that are in long-term facilities, healthcare facilities, uh, people of color. So uh, black, brown, uh, Latinx uh, population and undocumented persons has also been highlighted uh, in our conversations. Uh, we've also noticed that nonprofits, social service practitioners, educators, and policymakers are working together to address the needs of these populations despite the unpredictability of the virus's secondary impact on these systems. Uh, COVID-19 has presented many gaps uh, that have predated, obviously, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Many of these issues that we're going to talk about uh, that were discussed in our conversation are things that have already been in, already uh, part of society. Uh, so the first that we're going to talk about uh, is information gaps uh, existing, the delay in information. Um, there was delayed information from the federal government. Uh, which caused many issues. Um, access gaps, so access to food. Uh, we've even seen access to things such as toilet paper or facial masks have been an issue. The Wilkinsburg, uh, Marita Garrett mentioned uh, that the free store in Wilkinsburg was distributing masks because it was such an inequity of getting masks. So many people who needed the masks for even travel or essential travel that were essential workers did not have access to them. Um, and that was one of the resources they used to help. Uh, technological gaps. I mean, that's been one that's been an issue for some time. Many of the school systems are already under-resourced, um, but given the pandemic, now it's even worse. Uh, many children are out of school and limited to resources, such as laptops, Chromebooks, uh, Wi-Fi access. Uh, many of the teachers have to adapt to these styles uh, virtually. Um, some of our older teachers who have not had this access are learning a whole new way of learning. Uh, which has presented many issues, um, which can result in students being inadvertently left behind. Uh, student and parents learning. So students, our parents are also having to become these teachers um, and picture being an essential worker and then having to come home and learn how to use, utilize a computer or, you know, find access and, and to make sure that your student is still uh, receiving adequate uh, and edu adequate education can sometimes be difficult. So making note of that and remembering that those kind of uh, inequities exist. Uh, with schools being closed, uh, there are less eyes on children. What does that mean uh, as far as child abuse? So there are a lot of things uh, in children's safety that are be gone, be, being unnoticed. Um, DHS reported that there was a significant decrease on child live reports since the inception of the pandemic. So that means that a lot of child abuse is going unnoticed. So we must be you know, vigilant and still remembering and checking on our neighbors um, as we are going through this pandemic. Some other things to think about are safe spaces. Uh, Betty Cruz from the World Affairs Council really highlighted uh, the idea that home isn't necessarily a safe place for people. Um, in the way of domestic violence, um, there's been an increase. Uh, the Pfizer Foundation actually did an opt-ed uh, that I'd encourage you to check out 
uh, highlighting domestic violence and calls to Pittsburgh police has gone up 20 to 30% in the last month uh, as it relates to domestic violence. So that's something to look out for. Another good um, important point is the fear of the other. Uh, racism has also been a highlighted theme as a result to the pandemic. Um, you've often heard uh, even government officials uh, identify this as a Chinese virus um, and Asian populations have been, I've even heard reports of uh, restaurants and things that have been targeted as a result uh, of the pandemic. Um, so it is government officials and the media have also helped to perpetuate divisive rhetoric. rhetoric. Uh, so we have to be careful in the media that we're consuming. Also again, going back to health disparities, pre-existing conditions and illnesses for black and brown populations, as well as testing limitations uh, that have been in place. So one just can't get tested simply because they want to find out. Um, you definitely have to have uh, measures and have to have access to get to these sites. Uh, the immigrant and refugee population is another uh, big point uh, that was brought up. Many are already facing challenges uh, being in a new country, but not only that, but adding the pandemic to it uh, makes it 10 times worse. So receiving uh, information, uh, e even if that's in their uh, preferred languages. So many people are being left behind because they don't have the information in their respective languages. What does this mean for the schools? What does it mean for the work? What does it mean for their livelihood? What else can be done? Well, one of the things that they talked about, and I'm a huge proponent on recommendations. So we did spend, uh, although we talked about many of the disparities and many of the social justice issues, we did want to spend a, a significant amount of time on recommendations for those that are going through it as we are all going through this pandemic. And one of them was just by changing our lens, not viewing this as a specific disease that just targeted for African Americans or Chinese or elderly or uh, low income. But this is a, a disease that significantly impacts, impacts us all. So what can we do? Just change our lens, empowering our neighbor. We must ask ourselves, well, how can we meet the needs of the people who are in need? How can we assist our elders? Can we do market runs? Can we take prescription drug or pick up pre prescription drugs? Can we, um, you know, help help each other from a distance uh, in some of the things in, uh, that we need in our basic needs? Solidarity and recognizing the partnerships have existed. Um, Pittsburgh is doing a pretty good job of that. We have a lot, a, a huge foundation community here. A lot of nonprofits are working together and collaborating on efforts to help people who are impacted by COVID nineteen directly. Countering the fear of isolation during this time. So doing things that are normal, taking a walk, getting some air, taking a drive, um, things that we do as humans, interacting with people from a distance. Yeah, I mean, you can actually, I think uh, even drive-in theaters was something that was mentioned. So there are a ton of different avenues that people can take to still feel human and not so isolated. So we don't want you to, you know, get that fear of, of staying in the house and, and, and it's impacting you as well. Getting a hold of uh, elected officials, that was another big point. Holding them responsible and accountable for many of the social injustices that exist. Writing to your local politician, calling, signing petitions. There are tons of different things you can do. Sharing information with those who may not have it um, is, is another good way to do it. We don't have all the resources to fill the gaps, but we can take responsible measures to help those who may need it as we're all in this together. And with that being said, I'm gonna take it away and give it over to Jess. Oh, also, oh, before I do that, I wanted to note, um, here are some of the resources for the public policy and community resources. These will also be available for you uh, on our social media website. So if you follow our Facebook page, you'll find these resources here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and uh, I think that the, you know, the public policy and community <laughs> panel really highlighted so much of what's going on in terms of disparities on, on a large scale. Uh, but we also felt it was really important to talk to individuals who are leading grassroots efforts uh, to address uh, needs that have been exacerbated or um, have come about as a result of the pandemic. And so our second panel was uh, COVID-19 and social justice in Pittsburgh grassroots impact and response. And for that panel in particular, uh, we, we tried to get a, a really a di diverse group of, of panelists doing different kinds of work. 
uh, in the city. So we had Monica Ruiz, the executive director of Casa San Jose, uh, an organization here in Pittsburgh that works with Latinx communities and, and, and undocumented communities. Um, Gabriel McMorland, the executive director of the Thomas Merton Center. Miracle Jones, Director of Policy and Advocacy at One Hood Media, uh, and Laura Chu uh, Wines, uh, Executive Director of Pittsburghers for Public Transit. Uh, and finally, Richard L. Morris, the Director of Housing uh, for the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh. Uh, not only were a lot of these folks doing really great work uh, within their organizations on their own, but also collaborating with each other. So it was interesting to hear through the panel um, about how some, how, how some of these folks have partnered um, to, to address issues. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So I think some of the, the key takeaways from the grassroots impact and response panel fell into um, kind of three, three categories. So first, um, the importance of adapting and strengthening existing grassroots responses. A lot of these organizations, all of these organizations that we talked to um, have been doing uh, important grassroots work to address systemic inequities in the city of Pittsburgh and beyond. Uh, but of course, because of uh, new issues that have come to light or been exacerbated as a result of the pandemic, they've had to uh, creatively and intentionally shift the work that they're doing and, and sometimes ramp it up. Um, so an example of this um, that was really powerful was uh, Laura, uh, the executive director of Pittsburgh Public uh, Pittsburghers for Public Transit talking about the fact that her organization has been doing transit advocacy to increase uh, access to public transit in communities that have less access currently. Many of those communities in the city of Pittsburgh being uh, low in community, low income communities, communities with higher proportion, uh, higher proportions of African Americans and folks working low wage job, low wage jobs. Um, and that was an issue prior to the pandemic. But now, even though ridership uh, on Pittsburgh public transit has decreased significantly, I want to say 60 to 80 percent, folks who are still working in what we now deem essential jobs are having a harder time getting to work because for a long time under the pandemic, transit access decreased significantly. There were fewer buses running, there were limits to and still are limits to the number of people that can ride buses. And therefore, folks who are doing, you know, the important work of taking care of their families, taking care of all of our communities um, as essential workers, getting groceries, getting, uh, you know, prescriptions at the pharmacy were having a much harder time and still are having a much harder time doing that. So Pittsburghers for Public Transit really pivoted to advocate for increased transit access, uh, hazard pay for bus drivers who are, you know, risking their lives driving these buses, um, and were able to successfully advocate for a transit stimulus package for the city of Pittsburgh, um, which we recently got and are continuing to do that. Um, another really key point uh, is that uh, gaps in government and large institutions relief efforts that were discussed at you know our first panel at great length um, oftentimes leave out already marginalized communities. So uh, Richard L. Morris of the uh, uh, Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh who works in housing was talking about how some of our most systematically marginalized communities um, are, are really struggling to make rent right now. And while there is an eviction of moratoriums in Allegheny County, um, that, you know, that moratorium on evictions isn't going to last forever. And eventually rent will be due. And if folks are out of work um, or struggling to make ends meet already, this is just delaying you know, difficulties that are go going to come later. So how do we create sustainable solutions for those communities as opposed to, um, you know, band-aids or uh, solutions that actually um, exacerbate the challenges that we're facing. Um, and Monica Ruiz of Casa San Jose, who's actually working in partnership with the Urban League and Richard Morris, talked about how many of the populations that she works with um, are undocumented and um, are, are living in pretty precarious housing situations where they may not um, be on a lease um, because, of the, because they don't have documentation um, and are therefore subject to um, you know, a lot more potential abuse from landlords or um, may not have the eviction moratorium, um, you know, taken, uh, taken seriously by uh, their landlords for, for their families. Um, and in addition to that, those communities are not getting, you know, stimulus checks, they're not getting uh, unemployment money. Um, and so and many of them are out of work. And so they're, you know, the, the already difficult situations that they may be in are, are being uh, amplified. 
So uh, both, both Richard and um, Monica and many of our other panelists talked about the fact that real solutions at a policy level and at a grassroots level need to be holistic, they need to include everyone, and they need to center the communities that are most impacted. Uh, finally, amidst these challenges, um, you know, this moment has created new opportunities for transformative change, not to um, minimize the, you know, horrible effects of, of, of what's going on and much of what we're talking about, but, but in this moment, um, you know, grassroots organizations are advocating for and seeing things that we haven't seen before. Um, Gabriel McMorland of the Thomas Merton Center um, and Miracle Jones of One Hood Media have been involved in um, uh, criminal justice reform uh, advocacy for a long time with their organizations advocating for an end to um, cash bail, you know, uh, keeping people in jail solely because they uh, cannot afford to, to pay bail. Um, folks who are in Allegheny County Jail right now um, awaiting trial um, for, for nonviolent crimes. And so uh, uh, there are a lot of, of public health risks for people at the Allegheny County Jail. And while certainly um, ACJ has, has not um, let go the, the number of people that, that these advocates are, are asking for, um, those communities have been, have been successful in pushing for the release of, of some people who are incarcerated, uh, some people who are in ACJ. And so we're seeing, you know, things that communities have been pushing for for a long time starting to happen in some ways. Um, so what would it look like for that to continue to happen after the pandemic? Or, um, you know, kind of pushing what is possible, I think is really critical. And these folks are, are leading the way. Uh, so at the end of uh, this panel on our social media, we shared the uh, social media handles and websites of all of the participating organizations, as well as some uh, educational resources um, and, uh, you know, support resources um, related to the topics that were discussed. Uh, and these are on our social media at uh, Carlo underscore SJI if you want to check them out. Okay, um, also uh, in an effort to engage Carlo student faculty and staff, uh, we have been working with the Social Justice Institute Student Club uh, through Zoom discussions. So we've been working with that. Uh, we've also been working with the SEI Student Club by doing the in an email list. So we've been distributing information that way. Um, our weekly, uh, you just saw two templates of that uh, with different resources. So it's a social media campaign that we're using to further our reach and cast our net a little wider. Um, also with community partnerships, in which we'll talk about um, also a little bit later. Um, we've been working with different community organizations uh, as a consortium to, to help uh, those impacted by COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to what Ryan said, um, I do a lot of work with, with our Social Justice Institute Student Club, which existed prior to um, you know, COVID-19, but we've, um, as many people are, you know, we've been adapting by moving online. Um, and our Zoom discussions, I really just want to highlight that one because that has been a, gr a really important opportunity, I think, for our students to connect with each other outside of a class or a Zoom classroom setting, um, share some of what they're going through and also make connections between their own lived experiences and some of the systemic issues that we're seeing and we've been talking about. Um, we've also been able to share resources with each other through that email list. So if students are struggling with something, um, they, they may be able to find some, some sort of community resource that can help them out. Okay, and uh, before we close and open it up for Q&A, uh, we just wanted to leave you with this quote from Malcolm X as it was his birthday yesterday and thought that it was important to share. Uh, when I is replaced by we, even illness becomes wellness. So in, with that being said, I want us to all keep that in consideration and in mind as we're going through this all together, we're in this together, uh, but also don't forget our neighbors and those who are, uh, are a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, and finally, if you want to uh, reach out to us, uh, we have our, our email addresses here. We, we want to be available to um, the Carlo community as well as the, the broader community. Um, social media is a great way to engage with us. Uh, um, as Ryan mentioned, we're regularly sharing resources um, related to COVID-19 and social justice, as well as um, you know, resources that individuals and families can use to access what they need right now. And with that, we'd like to, to open it up to questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Terrific, thank you, Jess and Ryan.
Uh, that was really informative. You're doing some great work. And uh, it's good to see all the collaboration uh, within the community, um, particularly the grassroots organizations. That's terrific. Um, we do have a few questions here. Um, one question uh, that has come up is, how can we personally help marginalized populations? Okay. I was saying, I think we can probably both jump in. Um, but one of the things that, um, that we talked about a lot is being neighborly, um, just checking on people. I mean, and it's, it's as basic as, uh, you know, knocking on the door, obviously, with your, with your mask and, and social distance, of course, uh, but checking on those who, who may need it. Also, I would also recommend calling the United Way's 211 line um, and also letting them know how or asking ways that you can help. Um, I've talked to people who have made meals for people um, and even things that are low cost. I mean, something like, you know, a spaghetti meal dinner and dropped it off to a family. Um, there are numerous things that can be done that, you know, aren't really going out of our way uh, to just help, help a person in need. It could be your time, talent, or treasure um, that can help help a uh, vulnerable population. Yeah, and just to, just to add to what Ryan said, I think on a, you know, on a systemic level, um, there are so many organizations um, out there that are doing work to advocate for um, the communities that are most impacted and, and many of, you know, the, those organizations are led by people who, who are part of those communities. So uh, many of them are people we talk to. So uh, I definitely recommend, um, you know, paying attention to the information um, and resources that those organizations are putting out, um, following their advocacy, following their lead. Um, you know, in many cases, maybe uh, it might be contacting elected officials um, or uh, learning to, to, you know, to better understand where the gaps are so that you can advocate for, for changes in policy that really um, include those communities that are currently being left out. And um, on our social media, we have, you know, information about a couple different organizations that we talked to that are doing some of that work. Terrific, terrific. Um, you mentioned the foundation community earlier, Ryan, and how, you know, generous they are. Are you, either one of you seeing, what else could the foundation community do to help support the marginalized communities? Well, I think one of the things that is unique about Pittsburgh, and uh, I mean, I, I just have to applaud uh, the way Pittsburgh is moving in the way of the foundation community because of really, the, uh, many of them have hopped up to the occasion. Uh, the Pittsburgh Foundation being one, I know R.K. Mellon has a uh, response initiative through COVID-19, Heinz Endowments as well. Um, and I've also, I know, I believe uh, Opportunity Fund has a commitment to community uh, grant also uh, that, they're, that they were working on too. So they're providing a lot of resources for folks. So it definitely monetarily um, is the best, one of the best ways um, to do it, but also providing other resources and information sharing. I think one of the biggest things that, um, you know, and I guess eye-opening for me um, in working with like Casa San Jose or other organizations is just really this, measure to help those who uh, things aren't translated. Uh, so if it's not in their language and they're just not receiving this information, um, it's just been a, it's been a detriment, you know, for, for the family. Um, so, you know, providing, and I know some foundation communities are working with, you know, for these foundations in order to bridge that gap. Okay, terrific. Um, we have a question about if COVID-19 continues to impact the school systems into the fall, and we know that there are students that you know don't have the technical technological uh, support that they need. They don't have internet in their homes, or they don't have um, uh, the computers they need. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I have done a lot of work with youth and families, and and continue to. And and I think something that's important to note before we talk about solutions is I think you know this is really highlighting. We talk about the ways that this pandemic is highlighting pre-existing inequities, I think that this is a really profound example because people's lack of access to technology and resources impacted many students, um, you know, educational experiences prior to this. Um, and we're certainly seeing that still happen. Um, it, you know, it, it took a while, but the Pittsburgh Public Schools is starting to get, um, ha has started to get, uh, uh, laptops out to many students. I believe all high schoolers have them now. They've gotten them, I think, to all eighth graders as well. Um, but there are certainly tech issues. So I think that we need to view this holistically, um, long term. Frankly, even if students do go back to school, I think it's in the interest of the school system. If they, you know, in, in 
really supporting students to make sure that everyone has access to um, to internet at home and to technology at home. There are a lot of initiatives um, to bring internet access to um, to low income communities to families that don't have it. So uh, definitely, you know, increasing um, that access and and perhaps um, you know thinking about how those of us uh, those of us in neighborhoods with families um, who may not have internet access can help connect those folks to uh, Comcast and um, to some of the the Pittsburgh Public Schools existing resources as well. Um, yes, I'm seeing something about uh, hotspots or public Wi-Fi, uh, and uh, that's definitely something I think that that's being discussed currently. And Comcast um, has a program for at least did have a program. I don't know if it's continuing for free um, internet access for a period of time for families. But we really need to to kind of think of what are those long term solutions. Right. And yeah, and that program is actually the um, Comcast Internet Essentials, um, which is is uh, free or reduced. Uh, I know if there's they're on free or reduced lunch, uh, typically they get it. But I know they're doing something specific for the COVID nineteen to help those families as well. Terrific. Well, I want to, we're almost out of time. Um, I want to just thank Ryan and Jess one more time for joining us today. We're grateful for your time and for your support of this really important mission within the Social Justice, Justice Institutes of Carlo University. So thank you both. Thank and you. I want to thank, I want to thank our audience for joining us for Carlo Connections today and throughout the months of April and May. Um, beginning in June, we're going to go to a bi-monthly format and our first uh, Carlo Connections will be June 10th for a live cooking demonstration featuring Chef Chuck Kerber. So watch your email for additional uh, details about this fun event. And the last thing I want to mention today before we close is today is Carlo's Day of Giving. And we are raising money for the Student Emergency Fund. And many of our students are facing uh, needs for um, being able to afford food, pay their rent, uh, they've lost their jobs right now um, and they're looking for uh, help. And so we've raised um, just about $77,000 right now. Um, today we have a challenge. We, uh, we have $27,000 uh, being challenged to us that will be matching every gift dollar for dollar. And we have a new challenge and that challenge is if we receive 200 donors today, we will receive an extra $10,000 from another donor to support the Student Emergency Fund. So I encourage you, no gift is too small. I encourage you to consider making a gift to the Student Emergency Fund today. And to do so, please visit alumni.carlo.edu backslash DOG2020. And again, we'll, we'll have that message out to all of you and we'll have this recording out um, in a day or two. And I wanna thank you again, all of, all of you for joining us today and have a great Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you.